What is your favorite cereal of all time? Captain Crunch. No berries? With the berries. I actually made a rap song called Captain Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you with the it. berries, nigga, yeah, you like Captain the berries? Crunch with the berries. Yeah. Oh, Captain Crunch with the berries. Just ain't, Captain Crunch without the berries. Just ain't right. I'm addicted to the Captain. He's my crack pipe. Open up the yellow box and crush your ties. Eat them all the time, even during exercise. Eat it on a patio. Eat it on a sofa. Eat it in my house shoes. Eat it in my loafers. Eat a whole box anytime that is open. <laughs> you a fool. <laughs> you a fool. Captain Crunch. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we'd like to welcome you inside the GGN News Network. I'm your host with the most, Finding Nemo, a.k.a. Nemo Hoes. And today on my show, I got a very special guest, <laughs> Super Bowl champion, tight end slash wide receiver. Yes, Martellus Bennett is in the house. Bennett, what it do? My man, just chilling. Last time I seen you was at the, uh, the ring ceremony for the New England Patriots, man, and y'all was having a, a total blast that night, man. How, how did that feel for you getting your Super Bowl ring? Man, was, I think uh, it wasn't so much about the ring. It was just about that group of guys coming back together and being able to hang out and party with them because that group of guys would never be together again in the wow. same room like that unless it's like some type of anniversary thing. But that team is totally different from last year's team, and all those guys would never be together again. So I think that was the most special part about it. How did it feel for you going to play with Gronkowski and Brady, knowing what their legacy was and knowing how they get out and knowing where you came from? How did that feel for you walking into that scenario? Well, at first I was, first I was kind of skeptical because it's like, man, I ain't about to go be a backup tight end. I'm doing, <laughs> I've been doing my thing for the last, you know, like, you know, so. But then after looking at it, what they were able to do with Gronk and uh, Aaron when it was there, I was like, okay, if anyone knows how to use two tight ends, it'll be Bill and Josh uh, McDaniels. Mm -hmm. And um, I had learned, uh, uh, heard a lot of good stuff about Josh, and Bill was great, and he was so up front. So after that, I was just like, all right, whatever y'all need me to do, let's do it. And you did that. I love the way you played your role. I love the way y'all came back in that Super Bowl game. And I was excited. How, did you think that y'all was going to lose that game? Just keep it 100. No, nah, like the interesting Man, thing. Man, stop lying, bro. Bro, bro like 25 points. Bro, the thing was, but we we was beating ourselves. We had we fumbled going in, then we threw that interception, and going in at halftime, we we kind of we should have scored, but I think we ended up kicking a field goal mm -hmm. instead. But when we came in at halftime, that was that's like we came in at halftime. Nobody was discouraged when we walked off the field, and so we go in there. And, and you know, I've been in a lot of locker rooms. I'm like, I wonder what this shit's gonna be like. Cause <laughs> this is like the first real adversity. We only lost two games last year. We had adversity. Y'all lost one season. without Brady. Yes. So that and then didn't other count. One was the last play exactly. against the Seahawks. And um, so I was interested in seeing, like, all right, we've been through a lot. This team has come together. Let's see what this locker room is gonna be like. We got in there. Nobody said nothing. There was no rah rah speeches. None of that. You know, let's, there's no Rudy or no any given Sunday type <laughs> speech. It was just a bunch of dudes in there. Everybody kicked off their shoes, grabbed some oranges, some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and we just looked around. But you never saw disbelief in anyone's eyes. And mm -hmm. I think that was like the coolest thing. And then the only thing we said, hey, we want this one's for the history books. We got 30 minutes for this, for to make to make this whatever we wanted to be. And we we were laser focused for that last 30 minutes of the game. I could tell. I spoke with uh, Julian Edelman and Amadola and Hogan after the game. Cause I was there. The unicorn coop. Yeah, they came. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? White lightning. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they came and hollered at me and chopped it up with me. And they just were saying, they was like, Tom said something in that huddle when we got the ball. And we just was locked in from that moment on. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, there was no, I didn't hear anything but what I was supposed to do. That's I know. It. Like, there was times we caught the ball, I'd be getting off the ground like, did we catch it? Did we catch it? Because I was that focused <laughs> on what my job was at that time. And I think everybody was like that. We were all looking like, hey, what happened? Because no one knew what, the, what happened on the plays because we were just focused on beating our mans and winning our one-on-ones. And so we wore them down. When you're playing with Tom Brady, right, the focus on knowing whether you're going to get the ball or not, how, how much of that is that is like entirely on you to really be focused on whether I'm getting the ball or not when you're running your routes? I feel like I'm getting the ball every single play. So every single one of my routes, I'll be like, <laughs> if they don't throw it, I'm surprised. Damn, man, what happened? I was open. That's the next right. play, I've, I've always felt like I'm going to get the ball. So 
Um, I learned to do that because earlier in my career, there'll be times where you want the ball and you don't get it, and it's easy to go on that roller coaster where you're like, man, I haven't got the ball. So no, I'm not even going to run Second, on. Yeah, the, second, the first and second quarter, and you come back the second half, and you're not ready for a ball, then you drop it, then you're like, all right, now I'm ready again. So not to have those mental lapses, I always feel like I'm going to get the ball every single play. And I expect the ball every play because I'm always open. As you should be. And now, this is a question I want to know. Who was the tougher kid, you or Michael? And Michael is his brother, by the way, for those who don't know. He plays for the Seattle Seahawks. He's the locker room general. He's the floor general, the conversation piece, and he's a straight dog. Give me the answer. Well, this, we never, I don't know who you could say it was tougher because it was just like, if you fought Michael, you fought me. Okay. So it was never like, we never went, like me and my brother never been competitive toward one another. Never? No, we always just pushed each other like, hey, one more rep. We always been those brothers like, hey, you could do it. I'm proud of you. Like, I call him every day, tell him I'm very proud of him. Like, whether it's the way he's doing in the community or just playing or whatever. Like, at halftime, I always check my phone because I get text messages from him. He'd be like, hey, you did this or did that. And the same thing if I'm able to watch his game, like, hey, work in a double spin move or whatever mm -hmm. and set this up. Because I, I just watch him and I watch him differently. We trust each other because uh, we've been working together for so long. So, But as far as tough, like, um, I don't know. We both. Did you play defense? At first, we both were in high school. We were both for the bookend. So he was on the left, I was oh on the right. Oh my God! So nobody got nothing. Nah, that was like the then the um, I played both sides, and then the guy did you know no pass, no play. So the other tight end that was named Z failed, and I went to play uh, tight end full time from there. <sighs> but I played tight end since Pee Wee football, which is unheard of. I know. Usually, you change positions in high school from I little league football. I tried to. I tried to go to free safety. <laughs> what happened? You ain't had a feet for it? Oh, no, I grew I grew like six inches overnight. One night I woke up, I was six inches taller. The only reason I knew is because I could see the top of the refrigerator. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I can see everything up here. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth. I was like the mom on the Muppets. I couldn't see anything. I'm like, man, what's going on? So that's how I knew I got taller, because I just like stuff around the house. I was like, man, I grew last night. So You had a growth spurt like that? Yeah, because I play point guard as well. So I was like a point guard tight end, which has always been an mm -hmm. a awkward uh, transition. But um, yeah, I just grew like overnight. I was woke up and I was like 6'3", 6'4". Damn. Let's talk about this book that you got right here, because this is real interesting. You just presented this to me. Yeah. Tell the people out there what this <clears throat> book is about and what it represents. So. First, I run a company called Imagination Agency, and um, basically, I, I do animation, I do ch and children's book, interactive children's book apps. I'm like the Black Walt Disney, you know okay. what I'm saying? All right, so, um, and one of the things I do, I do a lot of, a lot of my characters are black protagonists in positive situations, or just so more kids can see their likeness in animation and, and books, because only 3% of children's books are of kids of color, of minorities, and most of those are focused on their color, you know, their hair. Like, mm -hmm. my hair is not nappy, which I don't think is a great, a yeah. great story. So, um, but this one is like, so like, I'm a geek, and I like comic books, and I like, and I, I will still form a motherfucker. <laughs> um, but there's something like for kids, there's a kids that never anything to bridge the gap. So I yeah. decided to make a comic book that bridged the gap for both of those together. And it's about a kid named Buzz, who has a um, cousin that's a pro football player, and he wants to make the team, but he never really makes the team. But then he discovers something that um, makes him play a little bit better than he thought he would, but he don't know what it is. This is the first issue. This is dope. The home of the flying hippos. This is dope. I'm glad I could help promote this and get this out. So where can people buy this from if they want to support the cause? Oh, uh, you'll be able to get this on the imaginationagency.com. The imaginationagency.com, and that is the I-M-A-G-I-N-A-T-I-O-N-A-G-E-N-C-Y. I just put the words on the bottom of the screen, just like a telethon for you dumb motherfuckers that can't spell. Click the link below. <laughs> 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 no, nah, but this I think, I think this will be doing well. I saw... It's, I'll probably release it next week. These are the first issues. No one even seen these yet, but you and a couple other people. But I made them very, like, they're only going to be $5 because my whole th idea is to get it in as many hands as possible. So uh, I am the publisher and the distributor, so um, I own the whole process. So when did you start this company? In I started imagination. imagination Agency about four years ago um, when my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a daughter, it just changed your life. Man. So <laughs> my daughter just graduated, turned 18 yesterday. Talk about oh, it. Oh man! So like, so um, and my whole idea was like, so when you have a, you always tell your kids they could be anything and everything they want to be. But most of us are hypocrites because we ever, we never go out there and try to become everything that we ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And as you get older, you turn a multiple of dreams becomes one dream because you you become satisfied. Society says that one um, reaching one of your dreams or one of your goals is good enough, but it's really not. 
Um, so I was just thinking, like, when my daughter's born, like, first thing, I was like, what would she want to be when she grows up? And I would, like a, any good parent would do, I would tell her, you could be anything. Mm -hmm. But then if I don't go be everything that I ever wanted to be, then how can I tell her that? You gotta so give I her an example. Yeah, so and who's a better example than myself? I don't have to point, like, just like him or just like that. Um, Daddy did it right here in the house. So, um, and then when I started reading her children's book, there was not many characters that looked like her. So I wrote a children's book with a character that was named after her that looked just like her. <laughs> and same thing with the black community. There's not a lot of black kids in animation or in tech. There's only been one major animated film that's ever been directed by African-American. Mm. And it's been 27 years. Toy Story came out in 95. And since then, there's only been one major, major blockbuster animation, animated film that's been directed by African-American. Mm. And it's just because we're not introduced to the possibilities of what we can do in tech and how tech has helped us, but we're one of the biggest consumers of it. Mm -hmm. So just by being an example for other kids from the community I come from, that they could learn that tech is a possibility. And instead of rapping all the time, you can learn how to do scores for films. Hello. There's so many different ways that you could go. Instead of playing for a team, we gotta start thinking about owning teams, because mm -hmm. there's not one team that's on, that has a black owner. Mm. Talk about it. So that's how, so, so my whole thing is like, hey, look, I'm trying to give kids the avenue, like, hey, you get scholarships for creative writing. No longer do they just roll you a ball, a football or basketball and say, good luck. You can pick up a pen or pick up a book and be just as successful. Yeah, if not more successful, because now you're tapping into more lanes and now your body and your brain can really get, you know, the full use out of what it's really used to be. Yeah, and it's longevity, because football, that shit hurt. <laughs> I believe you, dog. You be in the you be in the trenches, for real. Tight end, mm, you be in the trench. You got to mix it up. And defensive ends, linebackers, safeties. Most tight ends don't block. I know that part. I be in there though. I be in you the get trenches down, though. though. Yeah, I get in there. You get all the I way down. in there though. You know what I'm saying? You get all the way down. Hi, my name is Stormy Friends. We're broadcasting from Granada Hills, California. Currently, the weather is nice and warm with probable cause of rain. So that means that your nipples might get a little hard, his stick might get a little hard, so you guys already know what that means, so. Now tell me about the uh, mixtape that you released. I'm not a rapper, but some of my friends are. Yeah, so um, I've been doing music for that a long- title was the shit too, I can't <laughs> even. <laughs> I fucks with that, I'm not a rapper. Some of my friends are. Yeah, my Get next mixtape. And my next one is I'm not a trapper, but some of my friends are. It's gonna be all trap music. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you a goddamn fool, dog. <laughs> nah, but uh, so I grew up like so. Um, I used to be in an alternative hip hop group called the Moonshine Kids. Mm -hmm. So my first album goes back like seven years. It's called Fast Food. It's on iTunes as well. It's called Fast Food, because Fast Food is this always... This nigga promoting, ain't he? I'm just letting you know. My you know. first shit is on uh, Fast Food. I, I just yeah, do a nigga. lot. Of, <laughs> I just make a lot of stuff, so... Uh, but nah, it's on, uh, it's on there or whatever. So I used to be in a... Then I started doing more hip-hop when I left that band. And um, ever since then, I always had a love for music. And every once in a while, like it was like a six-year anniversary, a five-year anniversary from doing the tape that I did last one. So I just called up all my homies that still do music. And I was like, hey, look, meet me in Dallas where we all started at, and we'll just record some songs. So I recorded um, like five quick tracks on the EP. I did like in 32 hours. And the thing was, it's, it's funny, but because of the transition in life, like my main, one of my main songs that everybody loves on there is called Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's like balling on you. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have Whole Foods growing up. So nah, that's like not. me talking about a, May, a Maybach. I'm talking about Whole Foods, <laughs> baby. You catch me over there, go get my burrito at Whole Foods right now. I'm in Whole Foods, they be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> hey, you Balling. Got, yeah. right, go back there and get that steak. Hey, let me get one of those, that Wagyu yeah. back there. Is that yeah. Japanese Wagyu? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They, they Balls don't know. Balling. They don't know. They can't even, you bitches can't even pronounce Japanese <laughs> Wagyu, you bitch, you. Yeah, is that certified? Give me that, <laughs> hey, so I go in there, you know what I'm saying, buy some pomegranates, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And, then, and then, like, my boy come over, they come by the crib, I'm like, yeah, it's like, you ain't got a pit bull? No, nah, I got a standard poodle, like a big old poodle. <laughs> <laughs> She be having all the fluffy haircuts. I be walking down the street in my neighborhood reading a book. You know what I'm saying? Hey, how you doing, <laughs> Mr. Jefferson? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, no leash. She walk right by my hip. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Stick. Yeah. I'm talking. You sit right here. She waits till I stop at the stop sign. I go check the mail. Then you could come. You know, so 
Yeah. I get. I still Honda Accord in my neighborhood, and I guess I put my kids in the house. Let's get in there. Let's get in there. Something ain't right. Something ain't right, baby. Go get it. Think they got Ricky over there. This nigga's a fool. Nah. So I had to tell them sometimes. I go tell neighbors like, hey, look. So there's going to be a lot of black people in the neighborhood, but they're with me, so they're good. So don't good. be alarmed. Yeah. They're all coming over here. No. I got to put mailbox, uh, things in their mailboxes. Like, Let them know that you got company coming yeah. by. Don't be alarmed. Don't call the pigs on me. It's just my homies. I know the cops, though. You know what I'm saying? So You good with them? I, yeah, the ones in my neighborhood. You know, if I have some barbecue, you know, I tell them to come over and get a rib yeah. or two. Yeah, get a plate. Yeah. That always smooths things yeah, over man. with the police. Who, like yeah. Who don't like barbecue? Then they get to try to listen to the music. I'll be like, just don't do it. They be trying to... So I love this song. You don't know this song. <laughs> That's the first thing a motherfucker want to say. I love this song. <laughs> Who is it? <laughs> Jay-Z? <laughs> no, motherfucker. <laughs> ain't, nothing like, ain't nothing like living in that life when you come from a different life and to be able to, to, to appreciate it and to give your kids a better life than you had. Yeah, but you always, you always like, you want to find a balance where they get the nice side, but you want them to still have that edge to them. Like, True. So it's like, I just want to drop my daughter off in the hood one day, you know what I'm saying? Like, so she can see what it is. Yeah. And then like, bring her back her home. So she know, yeah, bring her back home, like, like by our cousins or whatever it may be, but. We did that with my kids. I had took them, when they was younger, I took them to my neighborhood so they can see all the shit I went through, then their mama would take them to feed the homeless and do yeah. things like that so they could get used to real life and not be so, you know, pampered and so used to having everything, yeah. but know that everybody don't have it. Yeah, because I was worried because, like, I take my daughter, she goes to this really nice school, it's, like, nice, and I go in there, and it's like, all the kids are white. I'm like, man, there's not one kid in here that looks like her. Like, like there's stuff that I have to teach her, you know, that then, I mean, they want to teach her about Martin Luther King, you know, but, like, you know, Black yeah. History Month, yeah. you know. They yeah, for that particular 28 days, they want yeah, to teach her about Yeah, but, like, there's just so many things for her to learn, so I think, even with the school, I think the school system suck anyway. But that's a whole nother segment. and um, It is what it is, though. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a system that's broken, that's been the same for so many years, and it should be fixed according to the times. It should move forward just like the world is moving forward. That system don't fit for the kids that graduate. All the shit you teach them is not going to get them jobs. You should be teaching them tech, teaching them software, teaching them things that's going to be the opportunity for them as opposed to teaching them things that's 40, 50 years behind. Yeah, I mean, you think about everything else in innovation and how everything has been updated over time. The school system has been the same for centuries. The same way they teach, the way they go, unless you go to a private school. Mm -hmm. Then you go to a private school, but like, why doesn't every kid have the opportunity to learn like this? Because he ain't so, got money? Yeah, so, but I mean, but at minimum, low-hanging fruit, like, blue um, coding is about to become a blue-collar job. Mm. Like, it's going to be a blue, so every kid should learn how to code, like. Easy. Like, that just should be, like, the basics. Like, I mean, that's why, I, like, in, I'm working on doing coding camps in underserved neighborhoods. It's, I mean, I'm not here to promote stuff, but I'm just trying to tell you no, that. No, like, but that, I like when stuff. you promote that because, see, the neighborhoods that we come from don't know that these types of jobs exist. They don't know, and they give up fast, and they give up because they think that, shit, why am I going to graduate from high school? I ain't going to get no job. Ain't nothing going to secure me when I'm finished. But if this program's put in place for them to be in high school and be trying shit out and being interns and have an opportunity to see that this could work, then that information should be displayed because they need to know. Yeah, I mean, if you, can't, if you can't see where you're trying to go, how can you get there? And if they can't have a really, they can't have a vision because there's no one truly empowering them to be more or do more because there's not a lot of examples. Like LeBron James or kids come out of a neighborhood who have rough backgrounds and made it professional, there's a lot of examples of that. So that's something that you feel that's feasible, that's attainable. But like black guys coding, you don't see a lot of them. None. So you think that's an anomaly. Mm -hmm. But it's available to us all. So we gotta get to the point where it's just like, oh, that's just him, he's different, or that's just her, she's different. Um, like even like black girls in code and all that stuff like there's just so many different things and different avenues that they got to know that it does exist and there is a possibility. Well, we're going to turn you on to the code game, not the code in your cell phone, but the real code game so you can get that real long range money. You dig? Do your research. <clears throat> we code. Last year, Marty was named to Forbes 30 under 30 sports list. Mm. Yeah, that was cool. That's big. Yeah, I got on there not for my sports, but for my business and stuff. That's, so, that's why it's big. It's yeah. not about it's what you can do off the field because yeah. on the field don't last forever. Yeah, I thought it was pretty. I was a keynote speaker at Forbes too, and it was funny because when I walked on stage, 
everybody like because it was like first it was like Bobby Flay like everybody want to hear Bobby Flay talk about you know yeah, whipping, cooking and all whipping this it shit up, he, you know yeah. what I'm saying he up there you know, whatever then it was Michael Phelps oh so Aquaman then, and then the last person of the whole entire thing was Martellus Bennett <laughs> it was like Bobby Flay Michael Phelps and here's Martellus <laughs> <laughs> everybody started walking out I was like y'all y'all can leave y'all want to but y'all will miss y'all will miss out on the best part of the entire four talk to so, him talk to him so I crushed that. And um, but it was big. That was my goal. I set that goal at 26 to make the four of 30 under 30 list, and I did it. I just turned 30 in March, so I did it right before I turned 30. So that was pretty cool. I would say this is time for the smoke break, but he's got a season to play this year, so we're gonna leave that one alone. But the NFL, my shout out to y'all is I'm glad y'all listening, and sooner or later y'all gonna get it together. Mr. Godell, come holler at me in the green room. You dig? Don't talk to me, Mr. Godell. <laughs> you know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> we inside the Smoker Studio, Everyday People, a.k.a. Real Nigga Shit. I'm going to ask you some questions. You answer to the best of your ability. All right. What's the first thing you do or think of when you wake up? It varies each day. It varies. <laughs> He's just going to be difficult, this nigga. No, just, I'm just saying. Like, it just let's varies. try that question one more time. <laughs> What's the first thing you do or think of when you wake up? Let's try today on for, for size. I just... First, I uh, just think about laughing. First thing I do when I wake up is like, I, I'm, it's just hard for me to say because I'm one of those people that's excited to wake up. Yes. Like, I love to wake up because I just feel like, oh, shit, I made it. Like, yeah. Because like, you never know. It's like, yeah, I'm here. So, like, yeah. uh, my wife probably thinks I'm the most annoying person in the world. I'm like, I'm up. She's like, why do you? And I don't like to lay in bed either because I just feel like if I'm laying in bed, I'm just wasting away. So, yeah. like, some mornings I try to snuggle, but after, like, 7, 30, 8, I'm, I'm gone, like, <laughs> baby, I'll be downstairs. You want to yeah. snuggle? We can snuggle yeah. on the couch. I'm going to yeah. sit up and you can lay on me down yeah. there. But I ain't laying in this bed, yeah. like, get off my back. Take that snuggie yeah. off. My I'm daughter done. the same way. My daughter woke up and she high fives me. Bam, I'm like, let's go. Okay, back to the uh, Smoker Studio questions. Hot or cold? Hot. Tacos or burgers? Burgers. Ass or titties? Ass. What are your favorite pair of shoes of all time? New Balances, 574s. What's your favorite cartoon of all time? Tom and Jerry or Darkwing Duck? Darkwing Duck? Yeah. I fuck with him, too. <laughs> <clears throat> How many times a day do you think about sex? That's my question? Yeah. Shit. Sure. Sex all the time, <laughs> on my mind, everywhere I go. I'm trying to let you know it's stronger than any drug, even love. S. E-X, oh, can drive you crazy, can make a baby all night long. It's the perfect song. Jamie Foxx, holla at your boy. Now. Uh, that song right there, I was like, man. Sex. I mean, I just, uh, I don't know. I try not to think about sex, but, you know, it's, you, know, it's, you don't have so much mental toughness. Yeah, you can't fight the power. <laughs> you can't fight the power. What's the worst job you've ever had? I've... Um, I've never had a job besides, I always work for myself, so, besides the NFL. This is my last time working for someone else, too, though. <laughs> 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 Shit, when you work for somebody else, you gotta wear a watch, because you gotta be there when they want you there. When you work for yourself, you show up to me, no watch. I, immediately start when I get there. Talk about it. Talk about it. If you were stuck on an island for a year and could only listen to three albums, what would they be? Um, Erica Badu, Baduism, Currency, um, Pilot Talk 2, and, um... Myself? As you should. I, <laughs> I didn't know you was up on Spitter like that. I've known Spitter for a while, him and Musa. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. He's one of my favorite rappers. I met him when I was on No Limit Records in 1997. I remember when you came down to the South. You remember that? Yeah, I was there, I was around. <laughs> That's when I had them 504 boys. Let you wobble, wobble. Yeah, you know what you shake shaking, yeah. shaking. Yeah. What you know about I it? I remember when you did that, Master P. Yes, Master sir. P. If you could remake any movie and star in it, what would it be? Indiana Jones. And Temple of Doom? Yeah, probably. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Um, the ability to take other people's superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> this nigga had his answer cocked and loaded, and this the best answer we ever had. So this nigga is Jack a nigga for superpower nigga. <laughs> I am Jack a nigga. I jack niggas for their superpowers. What are yours? Give me your superpowers, nigga. You're no. nothing now. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be cold. That way I could do everything. 
<laughs> nigga thought he could disappear and teleport. He stopped the nigga in mid teleport. No, nigga, I have your powers now. You leave when I say you leave. That's a cold motherfucking twist right there. I ain't never heard that answer, huh? Mosique, is that the one? That's the one. That's the new one. Okay, now we about to play finish the sentence. I started, you finish. I always wake up. To get this bread. If I could work with anybody dead or alive, I'd want to work with. Tim Burton. If I could see anybody perform dead or alive, I'd want to see. Tuxedo. Um, Mayor Hawthorne and them? And Jay Guno. They perform on Friday. Out oh, here. Are they? That's my dog. Yeah, I was supposed to go see him in Chicago, but I ended up not going. He just hit me. You want me to hit, look that up for you? I mean, I'm down. I wanted to go see him. I'm going to snatch that off the list. I look for blank and a woman. Mental capabilities. If I wasn't a boss, I'd be a... A boss? My favorite position, <laughs> my favorite position is... On top of the world? My name is Martellus Bennett, and I'm a... Really fucking awesome person. There you have it. Point <laughs> same money going. I'd like to thank my guest, Mr. Martellus Bennett. Be sure to go get his book for the kids. Be sure to follow everything he's doing. He's with the Green Bay Packers this year with discount double check. He stopped by to give us some real love and to communicate to those who need some communication. I might have to change my name to, he's discount double check. I might have to be like Walmart rollback prices. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Mr. Rollback, you know, roll back the prices. Everybody get in. Let's go. No, no discount. I'm just rolling back prices left and right. My motherfucking glasses off. Game recognized. Game, we want to thank y'all for tuning in to the GGN News Network. I'm your host with the most fine Nemo, a.k.a. Nemo Holes. Thank my guest, Martellus Bennett, for sliding by. A.k.a. Marty, a.k.a. the Black Unicorn, a.k.a. the Orange Dinosaur, a.k.a. Captain of Fun, a.k.a. Mr. Awesome, a.k.a. I don't need no more hoes. Now, <laughs> say that there. Well, I am Nemo Holes, and you know what it is. Same dog channel, same dog time. We up out of this bitch. See ya.